All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're gonna give it a minute or two here as uh, everyone kind of gets into the room, but uh, we'll pick up uh, pretty quickly here and hopefully have a nice discussion tonight. Uh, we have a big group, which is awesome. So um, looking forward to an opportunity to discuss kind of where we're headed and where, where we might be ending up coming out of the uh, pandemic here and what the new normal might be. So bear with us just a couple seconds as we let everyone kind of come in, that number is still jumping here. So that's awesome. All right, I'm sure there'll be a, still a few more coming in, but uh, why don't we get started? Uh, we won't try and take up all of your night, but thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Kevin Cavan. I'm the Executive Director of Massachusetts Hockey, and uh, we have an opportunity tonight to talk about uh, program preparedness. And this was uh, a webinar that we look forward to kind of putting together here. We've done a series of them. Uh, hopefully you've seen some of the other ones whether it was on a player development format, whether it was on goaltending, uh, we've got coaching the coaches and we've got some girls and women's uh, specific programming next week, as well as some uh, officials webinars we're gonna be doing as well. So we're trying to cover most bases here, if not all, and uh, we're looking forward to keeping people informed to the best of our ability. Um, with us tonight, we've got Bob Joyce, who's the president of Massachusetts Hockey. We've got Roger Grillo from USA Hockey. Most of you know Roger is the ADM regional coordinator, and uh, Kevin Erlenbaugh is the associate uh, executive director for USA Hockey and uh, Development. So Kevin's joining us this evening. And then you see uh, Mike Diorio. Mike's our program support coordinator here in Mass Hockey. A lot of you might know him. And if you don't, hopefully you get to know him pretty quickly here. So he's uh, a good resource. And our, our tech guru and communications person, Liz Cohen, does a great job. So uh, that's the group we have here tonight. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Bob Joyce quickly to have a, a quick intro here, and then we'll keep things going. Hi, thank you, Kevin. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's uh, taking part in this webinar. Um, on behalf of Mass Hockey, I want to thank all of you for your efforts on behalf of your programs, your players, your coaches. Um, we are in unprecedented times. I hope that, you know, we can be able to provide you a little bit of information and resources to help you to bring back to your programs, your teams, as we try to collectively work through this together. While we'll try to answer some of your questions tonight, we're not gonna be able to answer all of your questions because quite honestly, we don't know all the answers at this point. We're actively working in the background, trying to find out answers to questions that we know you probably have. We may not be able to answer them tonight, but hopefully in the next week, two weeks, in the coming weeks, we'll be able to provide you with more information on how we get back to hockey. So again, thank you very much. and. Um, you have any questions please feel free to use the chat we can try to answer what we can but i'll throw it back to you kevin thanks bob and i think uh just a quick correction there i think is the question and answer button is down the bottom we've the chat isn't uh enabled tonight but the q a is there so as we go throughout the evening if uh you're listening and you have a question you want uh, to get answered we'll try to get to as many as we can um and if we can't um, put your name on it as well. We may reach out to you afterwards and follow up with you as well. So uh, we want to try and communicate to the best of our ability with that. But um, Roger, why don't you uh, lead us off here and take us down the path? Yeah, and, and before we get started with the, the, the presentation here a little bit, um, I'd also like to echo what Bob said and, and thank everybody for taking the time to come out tonight. And, and uh, certainly on behalf of USA Hockey, um, we're, we're excited that uh, we have the number of people that are uh, interested enough in the sport to uh, take an interest in this discussion tonight because it's a really important one, we feel. What I wanted to do was just to kind of stimulate some some thought and some discussion from our panelists, and, and we're fortunate to have some really high-end people here that, that have their finger on the pulse of, of um, not just player development stuff, but also, uh, you know, program uh, building and, and, and running and, and uh, expertise that I think will really uh, – benefit a lot of you that are on the call uh, this evening. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and the, the, first, the first thing we wanted to kind of get to tonight is, is where are we now? And obviously a lot of people have a lot of questions. We know the rinks are shut down here, um, but where are we sitting right now? And, and I'd like to start with uh, 
Kevin Cavanaugh, because I know Kevin, you've been in, in, involved in some pretty high high end uh, discussions uh, with a lot of really important people here in the state of Massachusetts. So not just talking about uh, our sport, or ice hockey, but all youth sports uh, in the area. So why don't you talk a bit about where you think we are right now um, and some of the information that you've gotten in the last uh, week or so here. Sure, and I think uh, they caution everyone that everything's really fluid right now. And uh, there are different reports coming out literally every half hour, it seems like. But um, yes, uh, we have been involved uh, in conversations. Um, the state was kind enough to include us in the process of uh, the discussions uh, for reopening and what that might look like. So um, there's been a great group of, uh, of uh, rink and facility uh, managers and owners that we've talked to. Um, we're, we're talking beyond that at the state level about not just rinks, but indoor sports facilities, outdoor sports facilities, and, and what the youth sports format and uh, landscape might look like coming forward. So um, what I can offer is that we're not, uh, we're not there yet, meaning we're not getting, uh, we're not going to be reopening uh, on the 18th. Um, but I think I'm cautiously optimistic that the state understands where uh, everyone wants to be in the sports world. Uh, they want to be cautious, but they want to be confident. And I think, uh, We'll hopefully get some pretty good news in, in the next week or so uh, with some direction. But um, most importantly, right now, we're going to see a new, you know, a new normal, as we've uh, started to hear that term quite a bit. And that's going to really reflect on what, what's it like going to the rink? What's it like when you're at the rink and leaving the rink? So um, the old days of maybe showing up uh, an hour ahead of time because you had nothing better to do or your, your carpool was leaving early, uh, probably won't happen. There will probably be some restrictions on how early uh, players can get into the facility um, as they facilities try and do their best to uh, keep them sanitized. Uh, there, you know, there are going to be a lot of restrictions from the CDC and the DPH about um, cleanliness in the facilities, how they're going to sanitize them. And there's some great information out there from the, the U.S. Ice Rinks Group and USA Hockey and U.S. Figure Skating uh, that we've seen already. So I think it's important to understand that the rinks uh, are going to do their best and, and have to meet a certain standard um, if we're all going to be uh, participating at some point here. So uh, they've uh, embraced that challenge and they're looking forward to getting back up and running. So that's a great thing. Um, locker room usage, uh, how's that going to look? We don't know yet, but uh, we do know social distancing is going to have to occur. Uh, so the traditional format, I mean, I've always thought that locker rooms were somewhat poorly constructed because all the benches are on the outside. There's a ton of open space in the middle that doesn't get used in a lot of cases. But uh, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, maybe some additional chairs put in there once they are opened. And uh, kids are going to be maybe getting dressed at home or at least partially dressed at home um, and, and being able to put their skates and helmets on before they go on the ice. Those types of things are all in play. Um, I think uh, quick exits from the rink when the kids are off the ice uh, is going to happen. I mean, get your skates off, get your helmet off, and get out so the next group can get in so that the benches and the uh, locker room areas can be sanitized and that there's limited crossover. So all of those types of things are going to play into it. Also, uh, we're going to have to take a look at what the numbers are. Um, we don't know if it's going to be 10 players on the ice, if it's going to be 25, if it's going to be 50 at some point, and what that uh, potential can be. So... We're going to have to kind of be nimble. Uh, we're going to have to be able to be reactive. And uh, as a program leader, you're going to have to do some, some legwork right now talking to your facilities. I think that's going to be a big conversation for a lot of our program leaders who, you know, you have ICE contracts and you have uh, responsibilities to make sure that you have ICE for your program. But uh, maybe not all, pro not all facilities open or open in a timely manner or if you use a facility that's maybe on a college campus or a prep school campus, you're going to have a different set of rules and criteria that that school might enforce. So a lot of good conversation needs to be taking place right now so that you're best prepared for when the rinks open and your program gets going, that you're able to uh, respond uh, actively. Kevin Erlenbach, um, I know you're part of a committee with uh, the U.S. rinks and, and U.S. figure skating and U.S. hockey. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what you're hearing, um, you know, across the country, not just here in Massachusetts, so people can kind of put that, uh, uh, you know, on their on their plate. No, it's definitely um, it's a mixed bag. It's it, it, and even within states, uh, there's different protocols and different communities and different even city ordinances. Um, you know, what we're seeing rinks 
many rinks are already open in areas like uh, South Dakota, Georgia, here and even in Colorado. Um, there's two rinks open in, in Colorado Springs where we live. One is privately owned and, and I'm actually not totally sure. I haven't heard all the, the pro, what protocol they have in place, but I do know the city rink here. It's interesting because technically you're not allowed to have more than 10 people in the building. So they're running um, clinics for older age group kids just to get back on the ice, but you can only do eight at a time, four on each side. And then there's two coaches on the ice, but the coaches actually coincidentally happen to be the ZAM driver and the rink manager. So that's how they're starting to do it um, from that perspective. I know it, it, for the places that are opening up, it's, it's 10 for right now, getting close to, for some of them, um, even 50 people in the building. Uh, I know Texas is opening next week where their rule is that they only have to have 25% um, of their uh, fire capacity. So what, let's say you can have 200 people in the arena, so they only have to worry about 50. So it's definitely mixed, but even, you know, I've talked to some affiliates that are multi-state affiliates. So a place like Missouri Hockey, Missouri's opening up with their rinks this week and Illinois is still shut down for, so no one knows when. So there's concerns of, of people trying to come across the rip Mississippi and, and go to rinks there. So it's not just for mass. It, it's definitely um, people are dealing and getting creative and, and, and people are looking more towards um, engaging with people, with their former teams of last year, more off ice, um, doing Zooms with their entire team, trying to engage in skill work. You know, we've, we've done and sat through a lot of webinars, as you are right now, with um, sports leaders. Uh, namely, I was on one with Aspen Institute, which is a leader in this, and they were talking about, you know, if, if you're engaging, whether it's a season now, if you're engaging with kids and families right now, it was, a, I believe, 71, it was in the 70s, so 71% more likely that they'll return to you when hockey's going or any sport's going. So really, families are looking for people that have empathetic to them and have the same value system as them. So, you know, it's a great time to, even though you can't be at the rink, to engage with, with messaging and off-ice workouts and, and connecting with teams and letting people know they're a part of the organization to drive them back to your program when it does open up. So, Kevin Cavanaugh mentioned this uh, already, but let's dive a little bit deeper into this, um, you know, preparation for what's next. Um, and having people kind of have some forward thinking so that uh, when things do start to open, there's a plan. And I think part of the discussion tonight is what does that, you know, how does that work? And, and so Kevin Cavanaugh, would you, would you mind diving a little bit into um, what you meant earlier about uh, preparing for, for what's going to happen next? Yeah, I think uh, that thanks. And that good question. We can look at the on ice and the off ice as kind of two separate areas. So, as a program leader, um, we've got coaches on here, we've got hockey directors on here, as well as presidents and, and treasurers, I'm sure. So um, the communication is going to be vital with your facility. I, I kind of stressed that earlier. I'm going to continue to stress that throughout the night. I mean, reach out to your facility, talk to them, have a discussion. And they don't know the answers yet about when the reopening is, but they do know that it's going to come. You know that it's going to come. And a lot of the programs, I'm going to guarantee, haven't had even started tryouts yet. Right. So um, normally at this time of the year, we've already got our teams picked, our teams preparing for next year. Rosters are being built. So uh, what does that look like? How are you going to be able to run your tryouts and what uh, what are your pre-registration numbers right now? Uh, those are all things that as a program you need to look at and have that discussion as to how you might run your tryout. And again, um, in the early stages, there will be a limit on the number of players on the ice. That much we do know. Um, so, you know, hypothetically speaking, if that number was, you know, 20 to 25 players, what does that tryout look like? What does that, you know, a practice might be one team on the ice based on our roster sizes traditionally. That's a different story, you know, down the road. But in a tryout situation, how are you going to accomplish that? So think about that. Um, and, and have a discussion within your program based on your numbers as to what that potentially looks like. Um, I think on the ice, Roger, I'm going to kind of throw this back to you, and I see a couple of questions in here, a lot about the, the ADM. Yeah, we're going to get only... to that. We're going to get to that in another slide. Okay, I'll, that's perfect. Yeah. Then I'll, I'll uh, let you get to that in a minute. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, one other thing for preparation is um, here's the unfortunate reality. We know based on the economy and everything else, 
There are people that have played hockey in the past as a family and they're not going to be able to afford to anymore. Uh, or not just hockey, but youth sports in general may have to take a back seat for a while. Um, so as a program, how are you able to uh, deal with those situations? Um, you know, someone might be used to paying X amount of dollars for their youth hockey and now they can't pay that, but they can pay Y. Is there a program that can accommodate them? What are the, what are the options for families to pay, for families to play? And um, I think, you know, on the financial side as well, the payment plans, how are you going to structure those? Are you willing to structure them for families if, uh, if we're in a situation where people just can't make that lump sum up front that a lot of programs traditionally ask for? So I think uh, flexibility on that side of it will be key. Um, again, to being as welcoming and trying to keep as many people involved in your program as possible. So I think uh, there will be some trickle down and at the learn to play level, that's a whole other question. Um, you know, hopefully by the fall, when traditionally the learn to plays pick up, we're in a much different scenario. The states talked about their phased in program, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Um, you know, phase three is where I think we'll see a pretty good opportunity to be somewhat back to normal or, or, or what the new normal might be. Um, but at least the numbers should be a lot better at that point for the facilities. But um, until we get to that point, uh, communication is key within your program and within your facilities. So that would be really, really an area that I think you need to think about strongly. Kevin. Yep. I'll, you know, I'll add. Anything to add? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm a little bit too much of an optimist. optimist. So I, I see, while this is a, is a terrible thing, what we're dealing with and everyone's struggling, but the key thing is that it, it, it's it's happened to everybody and, and to me it's an opportunity uh there's a saying that and it's never waste a good crisis so you know the companies and the organizations and the groups that are going to succeed have to look at this from going from good to great so kevin touched on some of the stuff but how do we use this time to go back as a, each one of us as a local organization dust off our mission statement and, and really figure out what value are we offering to families and kids um, ask your members right now. I saw some great surveys sent to me the past couple of days from local associations that are reaching out and staying connected and, and asking what the value proposition that those families want and to help think about and rethink the programming they're offering. Um, you know, the kids are missing a lot in life right now. And while finances will definitely be affected, um, I'm a firm believer that if, if, if hockey can show it's more than just a sport, but providing a lot of what families and kids are missing in life that hockey provides so much more as far as socialization. I know my kids right now, their online school is terrible. Like they've really been online classes. They're dying to interact with people and engage. And, and if we can fill that and, and, and tell the story about how your association fulfills a lot of things your kids are going to be missing in the near future, um, it's going to help them help you grow and help engage a lot of people. And, and just as things too that we're preparing. So as you're doing that, Kev said it, but I think it's super important. Um, please reach out to your rinks, um, find out what they're doing to sanitize and their, and their new protocols to, to keep it a clean. The nice part is, is I've heard people say, well, it's not the soccer field where it's open air and things like that. But the nice part about an ice rink and, is that it's controllable. It's a controllable atmosphere. There's never a snow day or a rain day um, in an ice rink. So we have to tell that that story to people of how, what's the rink doing? Can you do a video to show all the stuff the rink is doing to make sure it's a clean, healthy, and, and safe environment? Health is more important than ever, and, and hockey and the ice rink are, are committed to that. But um, if your rink doesn't currently, I, for resource-wise, um, have them connect with the U.S. Ice Rink Association. They're providing a ton of, I mean, a ton of resources and online education, excuse me, and links for free. They're not even making you be a member of the U.S. Ice Rink Association. Um, also, if you haven't taken a look, uh, there's that, the Back to the Rinks guide. So um, there's some programming things, but, but just things to think of as you're working with your rink and telling that story. And you can get all that stuff at usahockeyprogramservices.com. Uh, in the coming weeks, too, we're putting together a checklist that will have, um, it'll have one, the checklist of coming back to hockey, but then it'll also have best practices and policies and templates and things for you to consider, including we're developing some alternative hockey and recreational. I don't like using recreational. I like saying development programming. So, you know, start thinking now with your board and your, and your other leaders, how do we engage our audience and our families with, 
with new playing concepts like a development league where you can tell the story through things that Roger's been been preaching for years of puck touches and, and skill development. I already started doing that just as anecdotally. Um, I just got off a call a little bit earlier for the local program here in town. We're, we're going to totally change. I have three kids in that 10U category. Two are twins. I'm not that busy. So um, we're going to reinvent a little bit of that combined 10U, 12U development league, half ice, and um, really show and tell, start telling the story now about the value people are going to get by making that shift. That is not less. It's, it's actually more. And Roger, I'm going to jump back in real quick on just a couple quick things uh, to follow up Kevin as well. And um, I mentioned uh, tryouts and programs thinking about how they're going to handle that. Uh, I love this because being able to do this in real time. Jeremiah Tabor from Pembroke Youth Hockey sent me a text while we're talking here. Wanted me to remind everyone out there that uh, they, Pembroke has been doing their tryouts in the fall for a while now. So if anyone wants to reach out to uh, Jeremiah in Pembroke, uh, reach out to him for sure, and he would be happy to give you some guidance on what they've experienced and seen on, on the fall tryout versus the spring tryout. So um, that's, a, that's a good thing. And then uh, I do see a question on here, too, from uh, just to clarify one thing. Uh, Mike and Astis asked, uh, per my understanding, facilities can host up to 10 people, so are private lessons allowed? Uh, facilities are not open in the state right now at all. Um, they are all shut down, and uh, they, so there are no facilities open. Um, when they do open, what that number will be is still to be determined. Um, so uh, if it's 10, then would private lessons be allowed? That's probably the best way to go. Um, if it's 25 as a number, then you have an opportunity to maybe run some practices as team-based things or tryouts from a program-based situation. Um, but uh, as of right now, there are no rinks open in the state legally. And uh, so I just want to make sure I get that clarified. So let's, let's, let's touch on this uh, next topic here, creative thinking and membership. Um, obviously, this is a big concern for a lot of people, but when we talk about some creative thinking, um, Kevin Rowenbaugh, what, 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 what kind of things have uh, – you, you mentioned one already that you talked about in Colorado with your own kids. But what are some other things? And, and maybe touch a little bit upon, um, you know, club excellence and, and some of the, the resources that, that we have at USA Hockey along with Mass Hockey. Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that we connect you with. So we're, we're building a, a platform. Well, I, I, we have the platform adding contact to the USA Hockey Program Services, which is the landing site for a lot of the COVID-related content. Um, as far as growth and just even direction for your board, as far as governance and, and being leading with intent, being strategic, um, we're relaunching Club Excellence. If you've never used it before, it's a, it's a and we provide training and education for coaches and officials, but this gives training and guidance um, to, to volunteers, the board leaders. Um, so that's actually, we're having a relaunch here in June. You also have access, there's a program services team, um, Katie and Taylor, uh, which you can get their contact info from program services side or reach out to Kevin, um, that they're there to help you with growth and, and connect you with ways to get more resources and ideas and concepts. And, and even if you want to talk through some of the things that you're working on locally, how can we help amplify it. Um, if you, on the program service site, beyond the, the back to um, hockey checklist, they'll have templates and, and best practices. Um, we're gonna, as we go along, we're learning a little bit about potential grants and, and even resources we can help direct you to. Um, along the way, we're also, we're learning from everybody. So, so while we're looking for answers and people are asking for the answers, this is also my plea to engage with all of you. So share with myself and our program service team what you're thinking about what what kind of crazy ideas is your board thinking of because we're going to share that with everybody that's how we're going to do it together i poor bob here has been on way too many calls with me i'm sure already just with all the affiliate presidents to talking about how do we rally together and come up with a collective voice to show confidence and and, and, and a plan going forward and something else to keep an eye out for is working with U.S. Ice Rinks Association, U.S. Figure Skating. Um, we're looking to do a shared back to the rinks um, campaign that all of you will be able to participate in. We're looking at it happening in August. Um, obviously, there's some municipal rinks. I know in Minnesota, that might happen in your area too, where they're not going to be able to open in September, so we'll have to extend it. But we're asking hockey clubs to reach out to their partners at the rink, and um, are going to we'll have templates and, and a framework on how to host, but 
promoting how having a day at the rink. So inviting everybody back to the rink and also having new families come and show that the rink's a safe um, community environment that people want to be a part of and should be a part of and showcase the different types of uh, programming options your rinks can have, including hockey options. And that goes in addition to just trying to amp up the usual growth components we have with welcome back week elements and try hockey, which we're, we haven't announced yet just because we want to be sensitive to where we're at at that time, but we will later in the summer. But, so that's the standards, but the new stuff would be all the resources being dumped on program services, um, the club excellence component uh, that you can, get ask, you can gain access to your portal and really just accessing myself and, and the program services team. Fantastic. Um, program examples, Mike Diorio, I know you're, you're working hand in hand with a lot of the, the associations and organizations here in the state and, and uh, Give us some thoughts on, on some people that you've talked to uh, recently and, and some of the things that's happening out there in Massachusetts. Yeah, well, luckily, we, you know, I have the pleasure of speaking with a lot of our volunteers to see, you know, just like uh, Kevin Erlenbach was speaking about their program services. Well, luckily, Massachusetts is one of the only affiliates that has one in-house, uh, and that's me. And, you know, I can't thank everybody enough for the time that they put into these programs. Uh, and the best part is, is giving them support. Uh, and, you know, what does that look like? And I think one of the big things with this uh, – this quarantine is, is a reset to our perspective. Uh, you know, we have to be reactive. We have to be creative, you know, with what we're allowed to operate with. And after speaking with a, a number of programs in the past uh, few weeks or over a month, uh, to hear what they're doing and to hear that they're all in the same ballpark is really reassuring. Um, because, you know, as leaders and administrations for, for our programs, you know, our parents, our players, they're looking for hope at the end of the circle here. You know, they're looking to see, you know, they play many sports, you know, which one's really going to make them feel most at ease if they do have to pick one. Um, and I find that, you know, this is a really good time to reach out to community. Uh, Newton Youth Hockey, um, I speak with Lisa Casillo um, a lot. Um, we have a lot of hard workers here and, and her and her president really filled me into some of the stuff that they're doing. One of the big things is, you know, showcasing what, what kind of community they're from. Um, you know, that's stepping up their social media presen uh, presence. Um, instituting new videos, whether that's off ice skills, on ice skills, but specific, you know, to the players in their organization. Other things that they're doing, um, which again, other programs are echoing are, you know, maybe they're spreading out the tuition and, and maybe introducing a bit more of a generous refund policy. Um, a lot of the things that are looking for when it comes to a roster fee or, or money to be accepted right now, or they're focusing simply just on the jerseys and making sure that they have enough jerseys to outfit the players that they do have. Uh, and if they have to re reuse them next year, well, maybe that's an option. Uh, but again, they're being reactive and, and they're being creative. Um, the other thing that they're doing is, you know, giving exposure to our, their local businesses um, because during a time where they're struggling, I'm sure that they'll appreciate it once we get back to normal and hopefully they can, you know, help out some of the programs in years to come. Um, along the same lines of community building, Tri-County, uh, I speak with Al Ramsey you know, at least a couple times a month. Um, and one of the things that he's really focusing on outside of continuing his uh, ADM process and, and getting as many, uh, getting as much use out of the ice that they do have um, is really keeping their coaches on the same page as well as the parents. Uh, so spending a lot more time to make sure that there's a unified front so that this year when, you know, if you do have a great experience or if you had a great experience last season, uh, that that continues and the developmental process is, uh, is comprehensive. The other thing is keeping the parents right on in. You know, there's a reason why coaches are following ADM and there's data behind it uh, and they want to keep the parents along there. So keeping communication open, I think, is, is vital, especially now. Um, you know, the fear of the unknown is, is what's going to keep a lot of people reserved. Um, you know, some people are going to, they can't wait to run back to the rink. Uh, but there's going to be a large majority that are very cautious and, and waiting to see what happens. Um, by speaking to your rinks, by providing as much information on, on things to keep cleanly, uh, how their kids will be safe and social and, and have fun. Uh, the more we articulate that, I think uh, the more at ease and the more people will have back. Um, I, I want to touch back. I, I did speak with uh, Acton Boxborough uh, at length. Uh, when it comes to tryouts, Jeremiah Tabor over at, at Pembroke, you know, it's a great point to do in the fall. Uh, another option that may work, and, and maybe if you've been thinking about it uh, in the future, uh, when it comes to Acton Boxborough, they usually have their ice taken down pretty early in the spring. So they use what's called Team Genius. So their trial base, you know, has a, you know, an ice session or two, but their whole process is seven, month, is seven months. Uh, and it's, it's um, transparent uh, to keep things fair uh, and to make sure that the kids are getting a full look. Because we do know nowadays trials can be tough for certain kids over other ones. Um, 
and lastly, one of the programs that I did speak to that I was, I was really, um, really happy to hear was Hyde Park, you know, one of our, our inner city teams, you know, what are they going to be doing differently? Uh, and the best part about it, speaking with Jay Rourke, their president, was we're going to operate as if the season's going on. Obviously, we'll be reactive um, as it comes, but, you know, maybe we'll recommend dressing at home. I think that's going to be a big one. Uh, if we're limited to players, well, we'll find ways around it. You know, we'll have the allotted number on ice and, and maybe we'll do things off ice as well. Um, but maybe we have to have a little bit more fun. Maybe we have to do, uh, you know, 17 feet spread apart and shooting pucks against the wall one day. You know, maybe we're going to play street hockey at the, the local school or, you know, Whatever it is, we want to be a beacon of hope for our parents and our players and uh, giving them the tools to, to be successful uh, is very important. That's great. So um, now we're going to dive into probably 70% of the questions that have come through. <laughs> uh, so uh, hopefully we can get to, uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them because there's a lot of really good questions that have come through and we really appreciate uh, everybody taking part. But you know the ADM, and then obviously the over the last eleven years, um, certainly I've been I've been running around the area in the region talking about what practice should look like and training should look like, and and the one thing I would tell you is is I think there's a lot of um, speculation on what's going to happen, and I think the most important thing that you, you hopefully heard right away out of the mouth of Kevin Cavanaugh is nobody really knows what is going to happen uh, once we do open, and I think. The negative of us being maybe a little bit later than the rest of the country is we're going to have some test um, situations across the country on what this is going to look like based on the rules and, and regulations we have here in, in, in this region. Um, I will tell you that, that in, in, in my opinion and in talking to other people that the people that are going to give us the thumbs up on opening rinks know what the sport of ice hockey looks like. And if they don't, then people like Kevin Cavanaugh are explaining that to them. I don't think that the, the – I think the, the bigger issues of social distancing have to do with the lobby, the locker rooms, the benches. Uh, I think they understand that when the kids get on the ice, they're going to bump into each other and they're going to come in proximity of each other. Um, and I think the, the, the one big fear that certainly I have and our group has as far as ADM regional managers is that we, we get away from – uh, game-like situations. We get away from um, uh, conflict. We get away from decision-making and training the brain. And we go into static, um, non-thinking, skate-around cones, uh, which at the end of the day doesn't develop hockey players. So I think as far as what practice and what the rink will look like on a practice day or a game day uh, right now is, is all over the map. But I would say that as we move forward, that and as we get better answers, uh, we'll have another one of these and have some some stronger, probably more in place recommendations from our standpoint, from USA Hockey's and Mass Hockey's. But right now, it's just too hard to, to tell. And there's questions here about, you know, will the kids have to have a, a different mask? There's been a lot of talk about that. Will they have to have a, you know, the clear shield, a, a separate shield, and, and will they have to dress at home and and uh, there's talk about uh, the rinks having to sanitize after each session. So the, the ice sessions might be shorter. The number of kids on the ice, the number of adults in the building, there's all kinds of speculation. And we really can't tell you what that's going to look like. There's some thoughts, there's some ideas, but there's nothing set in stone. So I wouldn't, wouldn't really worry about that aspect. I'd, I'd be more concerned from your standpoint, the people that are on the call, about the social media part, reaching out to your, your membership, um, talking about the uh, and, and having plans for all different possible scenarios, being creative with your with your uh, setup, um, but we're we're not hockey still going to be hockey once it gets in there, and we don't want to get away from what's going to help you deliver um, uh, a better hockey player. We just had a uh, and I'm not going to show the slide, but we had a, a conversation with the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation, and they're going to go the opposite direction where they're they're going to shrink the ice. Um, and they're going to put, um, you know, their game model is going to be three on three at, at nine, nine and under. It's going to be three on three on a sixth of the rink. Um, they're going to go all the way up to 14 and under uh, three on three cross ice for half a season. So Bantam hockey over there is going to be three on three cross ice for half a season and five on five full ice. So um, that's a country that we're chasing as far as player development. Um, and so we've got to be really cognizant of, of our culture and environment here 
in reality of what's what's going to happen next. Um, there was a bunch of questions here that I'm going to get to, um, um, and I'm just going to uh, stop sharing my screen so you can see all of our lovely faces close up. Um, but there's some really good questions. I'm going to fire them off um, uh, to the people here. Um, talk a little bit. Uh, and I don't know if you guys can answer these, but we, we, they're, they're certainly worth talking about. Mm -hmm. Is insurance, additional insurance, the, the fear of being a business and opening up. Is any been any discussion about that, Kevin, in, in your talks or either Kevin uh, as, as we move forward here? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on the first part of that, Raj, and just say, I mean, obviously, if um, we are all bubble up to USA Hockey and the risk management policy that's in place, obviously, will will be comprehensive enough to include or exclude any of the situations. I think the reality is if the state approves the opening of a facility, um, even with the social distancing or modifications to that, then traditionally there's you know, a inability to sue anyone based on uh, contacting the, the COVID disease or anything of that nature. I think um, you're protected from the sense of you're always covered under the DNO policy as a director and officer within your program. And that's a great benefit that USA Hockey provides to all of our uh, registered programs. And I think that the, you know, the state will determine though what, what lawsuits can or can't go forward. And my understanding is they're pretty limiting right now um, on that. So Kevin, from the national side, do you see anything different? Uh, no, no, you, you touched a lot of it. I think the main thing I've been told, I was actually on a call today with a sport lawyer and, and, it, and this goes along with just you know, the three D's of serving on a board and, you know, the, the, the three duties and the duty of care, um, as long as the board is showing a duty of care and what that means is, is working with your rink um, at finding out what that new protocol is for sanit sanitization and cleaning and helping keep the rink honest to that and, and supporting what you can do to, it, you know, policy, additional policies you can do as a, associations as far as potentially at the beginning telling everybody to have to any claws like socks and jerseys and their gloves to wash in hot water after every practice session, things like that in the immediate future. As long as you put those policies out, hold yourself to them and promote it to your members. You as an organization have done everything possible to, to fulfill your duty of care and that liability. Uh, another question here, CEP training for coaches. Um, it's a great question. Will they be virtually, will they be in person? And, and we're working right now on that. There's actually a level four that's going to be happening end of this week out in uh, the, the mid, mid am area. Uh, that's a virtual level four. So th there's a, there's a pretty good chance that there will be some um, uh, virtual uh, training. Uh, I will say that, that uh, hats off to mass hockey. Um, we've done a few uh, webinars with coaches um, and we got more coming up uh, next week, but also USA hockey, we've done 28 webinars uh, with NHL coaches, <laughs> college coaches, national team coaches, NHL Hall of Famers, and Mass Hockey has all those on their, uh, on their website for you to go back and, and rewatch those. There's some really great information there uh, that kind of goes all over the, the map of player development. But, but that'll certainly be um, uh, something that, that you'll, you'll hear from uh, Paul Moore, who does a phenomenal job with our CEP training here in the state of Massachusetts. We'll know more about that as, as we move forward here, but there's a, there's a more than likely chance that some of the stuff will be virtual training for sure. Um, let's see here. Kevin Erlenbach, can you go a little bit more in depth? You mentioned something about U10, U12 uh, in Colorado with your, with your uh, uh, sons and daughters. Can you go a little bit more in depth in that? Yeah, it's going to be called the Tigers Development League. And um, essentially it'll be 10 U and 12 U combined at the beginning, depending on how many kids we get. Um, no travel outside of the building, twice a week, three to one, practice the game. When we do games, it's going to be half ice only. Um, and then a couple times of the year, we'll pull together anyone that wants to go into uh, more structured games. We'll, we'll survey people and, and put together teams for tournaments. Um, it's going to be built where it's like a Netflix subscription, where families can pay for the whole season, save a little money, or they can just do it monthly. So um, they just want to do November and December, they can do November and December and it'll be structured where it, it's just a lot of puck touch skill development, heavy, heavy. And that's going to be, um, I'm actually working with uh, one of Roger's um, cohorts to uh, develop a, a development league template for everybody out there to, to look at as a potential thing to look at. 
Um, so that will be on the program services side along with that checklist in the coming, in the next month, hopefully less, as we try and cut it down and just give some options around maybe three on three play. Um, and then I know just to go along with that, I did see one question, you know, ask about a survey about travel and youth sports. Uh, going back to Aspen Institute, they had done a survey to, uh, of all sports and programs and, and finding out parents' attitudes towards participating in travel sports. And only 51% of them said they would go back and do travel sports. And 49% say they were looking for um, something different. So really, as you're looking and worrying about tryouts, which is understandable because things may, that's all sports, that's baseball and football that kick off sooner. But there's definitely gonna be a significant amount of people looking for something in-house and recreational. And quite honestly, we don't know what, not just hockey, what society is gonna look like in the fall. You may, it may be somewhat kind of illegal to go travel to another town. They may have a city ordinance where they don't want other people coming to town or from out of state. So um, really as an organization, all of us, we need to start thinking about how to keep our customers in-house, provide them, once again, look at ourselves. what's our value proposition to the family mm -hmm. and, and engage and let them know what's going on, not just worry about the same old, same old. Otherwise people are just gonna not come back. No, but well, as we're going here, uh, Raj, let me just throw, throw in one more thing there because a couple of questions uh, refer to our border states and specifically I've seen New Hampshire mentioned a couple of times. Um, what I've heard as early as this afternoon is that New Hampshire will be opening up their ranks sooner than us. Um, so what does that mean for Massachusetts uh, hockey players and programs? Um, they're going to have their own set of standards. Each state is going to be uh, able to and required to come up with their standards. These are state decisions. So whatever New Hampshire is doing will be different potentially than what Massachusetts is doing. Now there's gonna be a lot of synergies uh, between what's expected at the different facilities. Um, but I think one of the questions that came with that was how do we stop players from going up to New Hampshire? I think the reality is by the time we get into our season, September 1st, and then you know, where we are looking there is kind of that back to school time, the start of the season. Hopefully, you know, we don't have any problems here in Massachusetts as far as where those numbers go. Uh, everything as far as reopening is going to be based on the state's numbers. And that's uh, the one thing that we keep hearing. So if the numbers are trending positively, we expect that uh, the rinks will be opening up sooner rather than later. But um, it will depend on those trends. So someone goes to New Hampshire, I mean, they could have gone there last year as well. No different, right? If they see a program that suits them, that might happen. But um, I don't anticipate that being a, a significant issue, at least in the short term, because we should be back to normal in some, you know, the new normal by the time the season starts. And I, I, if those of that are on the call, if you look at the chat room that's now open, uh, Liz has been, uh, Elizabeth's been putting some of the information that we're talking about on there, some links uh, to uh, the webinars and to the Aspen Institute survey and some other uh, interesting tidbits uh, for you to to kind of to use up. Uh, Kevin, I just I want to maybe go backwards again, just to make sure that everybody kind of understands what you've said now a couple times. But obviously, there's, there's a lot of angst and, and frustration with with all of us with with what's going on. But anticipated timeline for mass hockey openings and league openings. Fluid. <laughs> uh, I, I don't when the governor makes his next, uh, you know, I think May 18th is the date we're all kind of circling on the calendar to really watch. Uh, I don't anticipate that rinks will be opening up on May 18th, put it that way. Uh, I think that's a pretty pretty safe bet. Um, so what does that look like? Is it early June to mid June? Let's hope so. Uh, is it later than that potentially? Again, based on the trends. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's a cautiously optimistic window to start to look at. Um, and again, what it looks like at that point is gonna be limited. Um, is the number 10, is it 20, is it 30? I don't know that answer. I have an idea of where it's headed, but uh, in fairness to all the discussions that are taking place and how fluid they are, I don't wanna venture too far down that path. Um, but I think we'll be able to, to get back to some sense of normalcy um, at that point. And then hopefully, you know, as the summer goes on, I think that's when we'll start to see games uh, and the opportunity to play full games taking place. But that won't be, I think, in the first wave that we deal with when we open the rinks, I don't think games are probably on the docket, which is fine. I mean, this time of year, uh, we get, you know, the kids have been off for a while. Let's get them back. Let's get them skating and the games will come. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. Evan, can I just speak on a couple of the questions here? We, 
seen a lot of questions about face masks, face shields, wearing masks under masks. I know that some of the major hockey reps such as CCM and Bauer are talking about developing face shields. I also know there's been conversations and discussions about how an athlete can't physically compete with a, with a face mask due to oxygen intake. As Kevin said, these are all fluid, but these, are, these conversations are happening in the background. We just don't have specific answers on whether or how they will be implemented, but these things are, be wor are being worked on. So you can let your families know at least that the health concerns that they share are being discussed and these, you know, we just don't quite have the answers yet at this point. Yeah, and then just uh, you, you mentioned the CCM. I talked with Bill Tursky uh, from CCM who oversees their North American sales efforts. He's a mass resident here and a great guy and had a good conversation with him about 10 minutes before this call tonight because uh, I wanted to follow up something he had uh, let us in on. And both, I think CCM and Bauer are both working on some sort of plastic shield covering that would go over an existing cage. Um, and uh, will that help uh, the process of keeping kids uh, safer? Absolutely. We don't know what the time frame quite is there yet, but they're working on it uh, diligently. And uh, we anticipate that that being something that players would have the option to do probably. It wouldn't be a mandate for by any stretch. I think you get into a lot more issues when you talk mandates and, and getting heck approval and different things, but it'll be an opportunity to uh, augment your existing cage. So that's a, a neat opportunity that the manufacturers are working on and we hope to see something like that that could be beneficial soon. Uh, and just a question came through about the level four I mentioned. That is, that's a level four for mid-am coaches right now. That that had been scheduled for this time of year anyway. So to, 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 to cover that, um, that uh, already scheduled event, uh, they're gonna try to do it virtually and see how that works as a, as a uh, footprint for potential uh, other coaching clinics, CEP certification clinics across the country down the road. So we will certainly, uh, between uh, Mass Hockey leadership and, and Paul Moore, we will be uh, getting you information on, on what's going to be happening here in, in, the, in the Northeast. So um, uh, I think we, I don't know, we didn't answer everybody's questions because we don't really have, you know, definitive answers. But Two, two last things I'd like to say, and then we have everybody maybe do have a closing uh, comment. One, um, I'm certainly here for any association that would like to have uh, their own little mini coaching clinic. I've already done uh, a bunch of them for other clubs in the Northeast um, where they got 30 or 40 of their coaches on. We just had a little hockey discussion on player development and, and practice format and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I know for a fact that this group, this panel, uh, will be getting back together at some point as we hear get more definitive information from the powers to be on what this is going to look like so we can get the answers to, to you and, and, and run this effectively and smoothly. Um, and and my, my information is on usahockey.org, um, uh, but also Elizabeth will put it up on the chat right now, my email address along with my cell phone number. Kevin, any final thoughts? Kevin Cavanaugh from, from uh, this Yeah, stuff. and again, I think some great questions here. We'll try and get to a few of them maybe offline as well. That's why we asked you to uh, let us know who you are so we can reach out. But I think there's a couple that both came around uh, the concept of water bottles and water for players. So um, one of the, I think, requirements that you'll see when the state recommendations come out or state guidelines is that each player is going to be responsible for their own hydration. Uh, as a coach, you don't want to be bringing six water bottles like we used to and putting them on the bench anymore. If a kid wants their water, the player wants their water, they bring their own and they're going to be responsible for that. And I think that's going to be something that you'll see more and more of anyway. We've seen that growing over the past couple of years. But um, that's going to be a very simple thing that each player is going to be responsible for their own. Um, and that takes a lot of the uh, the burden off the coach and trying to navigate who's who's drinking out of what bottle. And, and that way, it's a very simple process. So just I wanted to hit that. but. Uh, more importantly, I want to appreciate this has been our best attended uh, webinar to date um, and you know, close to 250 people have been on here throughout the evening. Um, we are here to help. We want to continue to assist. Uh, we don't always have the answers. Uh, if we don't, we'll try and get them. We don't always have the answers you would want, uh, but we'll be honest and be as upfront as we can be to help you. Um, those of you, I, I introduced Mike at the beginning, but Mike DiOrio is our program support coordinator. His full-time role with Mass Hockey is to answer questions for programs, to talk to them, 
to help them get through and navigate situations. So please get to know Mike. One of the projects he's been working on for a lot of our program leaders over the past couple of weeks um, is really an introspective look at registration numbers over the past several years by program. So he's gonna be able to spit out some data for you and kind of talk about where you've been, where you are, and maybe where you're headed. Um, so he's a great resource. Uh, we're here to help and uh, appreciate everyone taking the time and look forward to seeing you back at the rinks hopefully really soon. Mike, anything else you'd like to just finalize? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, just to double down on what Kevin said, you know, I, I'm here to help, you know, just the way, you know, however this pans out, we're going to be here to help and we're going to give you the support that you need. If you have just simple questions, just what are other programs doing? I, I see that they're doing a good job. Reach out. You know, this is the stuff that we want to hear. We also want to showcase the good things that you are doing to your members. Um, you know, we want to make sure that people that are doing things right are, are getting the accreditation that they deserve. Um, and like I said, please feel free to reach out at any time. This is exactly what I like doing is helping our program managers and administrators. Um, and sometimes, you know, it really takes a, a good hard look into how we run our organization, you know, whether that's financial or just community building. Uh, and like uh, Kevin mentioned, you know, I'm working on some data here so we can figure out, you know, by the numbers, you know, where have you been, where are you now? Uh, but other things we're looking at is, is providing more tools to you to, to make things easier. Uh, like Kevin Erlenbach mentioned, Club Excellence is a, a phenomenal resource to take a lot of the legwork out uh, as volunteers. Uh, and on my position, I'm trying to find out, you know, your questions and how we can develop more tools to help you and make, you know, run an organization easier. Because I'm sure all the parents in your organization thinks it's very easy as it begins. Kevin Rohenbach. I think, I, you know, I don't want to double talk on what Mike and Kev's already said. So I'd say the main things right now is, is engage with your rink, find out what's going on, communicate and engage with your volunteers, be empathetic, be uh, engaging align with their values and what they're looking for right now and and you know and keep checking on program services uh USC hockey program services other than mike you know if you guys want to reference um we'll be adding content and, and we're always here to brainstorm and, and work together collectively with you and, and come up with a good plan bob joyce yeah I just thank you again everyone for spending the time tonight you know and just rest assured we understand, we, we understand your questions and we're doing everything in the background that we can to try to answer the questions as quickly as we can so that we can all get back to what we want to do, be back in the rinks playing the game we all love. Elizabeth, do you want to just uh, let people know what's coming up next week and in the future here with uh, Mass Hockey and some of the webinars and other information? Yeah, that would be great. So next week we're actually taking a uh, female approach and we have a uh, girls Girls and Women's Hockey Growth webinar next week with AJ Malesko, uh, Sammy Davis, Jillian Dempsey, and Haley Moore from the Boston Pride. We're also going to have a Coaching Females um, webinar on Wednesday, which will include all the Beanpot schools and Holy Cross, uh, and specifically for coaches who coach females. And we will have this webinar itself live on our YouTube channel uh, shortly after this. And we'll follow up with an email as well so you can have the link and we'll include uh, some of the different links and contacts that we included in the chat. And with that said, uh, we, there was a lot of questions that I think we got to, but as Kevin Cavanaugh said, we probably didn't get to all of them. I know a couple came in late here uh, with some tryout questions and stuff like that, but certainly reach out to any of us on the call and, and we'd be more than happy to to help you out with that as, as, as much as we can with the information that we have so far. So we wish you all um, the, the best and, and be safe and, and stay healthy. And, and hopefully we'll see you at the, uh, one of the rinks here in the very, very near future. Thank you for taking your time tonight, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.